Uh, so the next story we're going to be looking at is, let me just scroll down. It's called, And Seven Times Never Kill Man! Exclamation mark. Um, and it's a science fiction novelette by Martin, first published in the July 1975 issue of Analog Science Fiction and Fact magazine. It is set on the Jambles planet of Corlys, and it's about a conflict between the pacifist tribes of the Jainshi and an invading militant religious sect called the Steel Angels. Uh, in the introductory notes of Dream Songs, Martin writes that the concept of the Steel Angels was inspired by the book Dorsai by Gordon R. Dixon, while the term came from the song Star Spangled Bummer by Chris Christopherson. So how many pyramids would you give and seven times never kill man? I'd give it uh, three out of five. I thought it was an okay story, uh, but I got more out of maybe what it provided and in, in information about the Thousand Worlds and and the backgrounds in the story itself wasn't particularly interesting to me, but still worth uh, reviewing and reading. Mm. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm similar. Um, I guess I'll say three um, blasted apart, destroyed pyramids, probably <laughs> as well. Um, it's um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's it's also sort of similar. I mean, like it's a longer, uh, I think, longer um, story. Um, and sort of a more traditional story in the sense of um, having more of a plot or more of a traditional plot. Um, but at the same time, maybe to like, it's also, I mean, it's also a very simple story, a very um, sort of obvious story, right? Of like of an invading force and, you know, uh, an, a cruel invading force. And then the, the, the native population, the, the quote unquote primitive population having some sort of, you know, secret weapon, secret power that uh, that breaks the invading force after you know their cruelty has completely gotten out of hand. Um, I don't know. Maybe it was less of a cliche when it was written initially, but right. Yeah, I think uh, I'm gonna be a little hard on this one too. I'd probably give it a two, uh, two pyramids. I think. Um, yeah, I just I didn't really like any of the characters in it. Like there was no one I was really drawn to, or no one whose motivations I really understood in a clear way, and I was like really into their journey in a way. Um, and I thought, like you say. Um, like you say, Michael, like it's a very, um, I don't know, it's kind of like the Fern Gully thing, kind of. It's just not as interesting of a world sure, to me. Yeah. Just was less, as less engaging um, to me. I, there were there were little parts in it I really liked, um, but yeah, I just was not as having as having as much of a good time reading it as the other one. Also, yeah, definitely not a good time story. <laughs> yeah, um, I think I liked it a bit more than you guys. Um, I thought I liked the writing, and I thought it was an interesting twist on the. The colonists versus the indigenous uh, people story. I thought that I found the blind ruthlessness of the steel angels angels genuinely frightening. Mm. Um, and uh, like many of Martin's work, I, I found it had a strong sort of anti-war, anti-religion message. Um, and I think being written in the in the 1970s, uh, I think a lot of the political and social distress of Vietnam War is keenly felt in the text. Um, I struggled a bit with the shifting perspectives. It felt like the story and the message was often more important than the characters. Um, but overall, I thought it was strong, so I'll give it three and a half pyramids. Yeah, but I'm not convinced that Martin's necessarily. I mean, he, he's has he's an atheist himself, but he's not necessarily anti-religion as works, but anti-religion when it goes wrong, like when it doesn't help society or when it's extremist. I think that a dogmatic was, faith. Dogmatic that faith. Well, I mean, yeah. faiths that are not harming the society they're in. I don't think he's necessarily against. I think he can see the value of it. But this one certainly is mm -hmm. not. This one. This one has served this role. But what's interesting about the Steel Knights and Bacalon is, well, where, how did it originate? It originated when the double wars started with the Harangans and the Fini. Right. And humanity was in, I mean, in really bad shape there. Like, they could have easily been wiped out. And this source's religion essentially was like one of the ways that they fought that war, right? Mm. It helped them win that war. And, and maybe without it, they would have lost. So it played a role for that period. But now it's it's served this its use. And now it's just going on committing atrocities everywhere so it, it, it's it's done what lucan has said is it's not functioning society anymore yeah it's sort of it's an example of um a narrative or a belief in something helping you overcome terrible odds um which is it kind of shows some of the merit of, of religion as discussed in the previous story but then this is an example of it going far too far and just festering and and hardening people's hearts and yeah, I think I think in terms of the mythology of the Thousand Worlds, it, it opens up a lot, and I think it's it gives an interesting example of a the way a particular s sections of humanity have been uh, corrupted or corroded by the events of the Double War, and how that's pervaded into the current societies. 
Right. There's that explicit mention. That's kind of the reason why the, the steel angels, angels and their militant faith gave rise was because of that conflict. They mentioned the sons of Franga and the Horde of Findi um, in kind of their origin text of it. So I'm curious with that, is Bacalon like a character? Is that someone who occurs in other places? No, uh, but Bacalon is the the god um, that they worship. Yeah, so I'm, so I'm actually... wondering if there was someone who that was drawn from, right? Mm, like the, that's they took. Uh, n- not that I am aware of. I've, I think I've read all the stories, and I think it is just a, a mythical figure. I don't know if it's based on a particular person. I think it's um, it's more just a vision of, of a. I see, of a I see what you're child. saying, Zach. Though I mean, like you, you could say that initially there may have been some young guy, right, that took took picked up a, a phaser or something, a, a yeah, laser. That's what I was thinking, fighting. right? And then it, it became this specific. mythology came later. It could have been like somehow yeah. some child looking guy. A exactly like <laughs> yeah like the just this image of the child with the with the weapon like it just felt like it might have been drawn from like an actual thing that happened and they they distorted it and turned it into a myth of some kind but i was just curious if that if that occurred anywhere else in the stories but i guess not no i don't think so it, it's quite an eerie image though uh, yeah. just the idea of a child being a, 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 a sort of call to violence and a call yeah. to slaughter he's so ruthless um, although he and, he's, and he says like oh you, oh, you guys have You've beaten your your swords in the plowshares, like uh, screw, like shame on you. You need to make them back into swords, and you'd be too peaceful. <laughs> I should point out the pale child doesn't appear as a character in another story, mm. but it is mentioned a few times in A Song of Ice and Fire. I was about it's to like, say, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like the only we were talking last episode about whether there was any uh if it took place if song of ice and fire took place in the thousand worlds universe and there doesn't seem to be any explicit mention but a bit little bits and pieces of the mythology of the steel angels keep popping up in a song of ice and fire and i've got a list of the mentions um in a feast for crows Arya stark notices the statue of a pale infant with a sword in the house of black and white and then afterwards she learns that the statue is named bacalon and it's commonly visited by sol- soldiers there's, there's mentions in two of the Winds of Winter preview chapter, which I won't explain, but they're mentioned there. Mm. Um, and also in Fire and Blood, um, it's mentioned that uh, Princess Leia Rogar of Lys, the wife of Prince Viserys Targaryen, rejects the gods of Westeros and continues to worship only Lyseni gods, such as, quote, the pale child Bacalon of the sword and faceless Segel, the giver of pain. This is also a silly one, but the Proctor also says a pretty particular line. Uh, he says winter is coming. That's so. right. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe which might be the there. first, which might be the first time that phrase is uh, written by George. Yeah, but I mean, uh, we talked about this, I think, last time or in previous episodes. If George wants to, he can easily place the world in, in like uh, ice and fire in uh, this universe if he wants to. I think it'd be a mistake that's up to him if he does so. But I mean, you could just as easily say that George liked the imagery if he came up with this. He's like, oh, I came up with this cool idea of a. Uh, a kid with a sword. Yeah. I was going to use it over and over again. Like he, like he references other people who are orcs as well, right? Yeah, that, that's that's what I think. I think he's just recycling a cool image that he used in a previous work. I don't think he's literally yeah. suggesting that he plays in the same universe. And if he was, that wouldn't necessarily be the the that would figure be the to use because yeah. it's it's a mythol it's mythology even in Thousand Worlds. It, it's not like this character literally exists. It's just I'd, a kind of a nod to a previous work. I yeah, think. I'd agree with that. I think he just has certain images he likes to go back to. And I think we see some of that here with the, again, like the snow imagery that we got in Bitter Blooms and the blue fires and things like that. And and there's even like a white knife river in this. Yes, there um, is. So, <laughs> I remember highlighting that. Yeah. <laughs> so that, these kind of things he likes, just these images and these descriptions of things that I think he just is part of his writing style. Yeah, and even the conflict between the Jane Chi and the Steel Angels strongly evokes some of the historical conflicts in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like the Jane Chi could be the children of the forest, the the Steel Angels could be the Andals or the first men. Andals are described as these steel knights. Um mm-hmm. And a bit like the first men, the, the the children are defeated through combat, but eventually kind of uh, take over the, the the spiritual beliefs of the first men and sort of envelop them into their into their sort of uh, nature worship. Yeah, I think they even had golden eyes. I think, and it, it really did remind me of the Andals in particular, like the the fact that they were so dogmatic and violent and and wanted to put them down. Like it, it, it just there goes guys that you know that, that tattooed the or even like carved the the star into their arms, right? Like the animal mm, players, it, yeah. it reminded me of that. Uh, so the, the, yeah. the Steel Knights or the Children of Bacalon, it's kind of like the opposite of what the church did in the other story where they encountered aliens and they eventually decide, okay, we'll bring them into the faith. Here they said, no, aliens are just nothing. Like, they're just animals. Only humans have souls. They've taken <clears> that <throat> viewpoint. 
here and, and embrace that, which which with, with that viewpoint was possibly useful. Or it was useful when they were fighting Harangans in the Findi. But it's not helping humanity now. Yeah, the interesting twist on it, though, is this idea that they're not actually like going to kill off these these natives. Mm. They just want to wipe out their their religious figures, their idols, which are the pyramids. Like that's all they care about, seemingly. And, and of course, they do end up like hanging. Like that's the first image we get is they hang them up on the walls um, if they need to. But like it's not like this like war, like desire to exterminate them or anything hmm. for the most part. So that's an interesting like yeah. kind of twi- like yeah. I mean, they just want to. I mean, yeah. Basically, they just want to move them off the land, right? I mean, like they. Don't, I don't think they. I mean, they're the. You know, their philosophy is that they're animals, right? And so it's just sort of like yeah, yeah, shoo, shoo. You know. We're we're farming this area now. Please, they, leave. they view they view them as feral hogs, essentially. Yeah, like, exactly. We view feral hogs in like America. They view they view that they they just they say they have no souls or whatever. But yes, yeah, yeah. so they're, yeah. they're not actually trying to systematically wipe them out. That being said, they're being no matter what their view is, they're being extremely cruel and inhumane, right? To to this yeah, it, it's, destroy them. It, oh yeah, <laughs> it's a very it's a very sort of colonialist project. It's the idea yeah. that yeah. they have to be dehumanized in order to rationalize um, taking their land, killing sure. them. Um, the idea of destroying religious uh, uh, icons was practiced in colonialism and in warfare as a way to like demoralize the population. That's that's a good point. I mean, only very rarely, and perhaps only individually, do people like you know, except somebody has value and then, you know, wipe them out or kill them. They have to dehumanize them first. Like that happens. With yeah. The dehumanize the invasion. Yeah. Or, or else yeah. They would, you'd be killing people and that'd be bad. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, and, and that's that, 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 the legacy of racism. A lot of the sort of the uh, writing about racism, eugenics comes from colonialism. Like they had to yeah. manufacture a lot of these ideologies about subhumans and genetics and all these things in order to justify um, territorial acquisition and expansion. Right. Yeah, that's all totally true. I think for me, like the part that I just found strange is like in some of the encounters we do get where they are taking out these pyramids is like, it feels like in those cases, it may, it may have just been the particular commanders leading those efforts. Like they were very deliberately trying not to kill them. Like they were, there was like a, it felt to me like a deliberate, intentional effort. Whereas, like if it was a traditional form of that, I think they would just be like, if they're causing problems for us, why not just kill them off? You know, like if they're making this more difficult than it need be, mm. why not just kill them? Like it felt a little different in some cases. Hmm. There, there certainly was some f- uh, people in the Steel Knights that were trying to avoid killing people, or, or even there's one guy that said to just stop this, not worth it. Let's focus on doing elsewhere. Like there was a variety of kind of approach there. I think. Yeah, and there was a bit of a mirror between the two characters um, of the uh, the trader whose name is uh, Necrol and the weapons master, I think. Uh, so Necrol is trying to encourage the pacifist Jainshi to um, fight, to, to make war. And then the weapons master, ironically, is trying to convince the warlike steel angels to kind of uh, – to you know, avoid conflict. Um, and in both cases, it's just so fails. antithetical to their belief yeah. system, right? Like yeah. a part of it is literally like, it's blasphemous not to be holding a weapon. <laughs> like yeah. that is part of, like that's just yeah. wrong. But, but yeah. I think the key line here is, is in, in Bakalan's name, we must assert our dominion over them. So mm. when it comes to things like the Harangans, they're just too dangerous to be allowed to live. They must be killed, but then they don't say kill everything because that defeats, they have to assert their dominion over the rest of them. It's funny, I think, though, and, and maybe this is some of the frustration with the story that a lot of what those two characters do is basically pointless. They don't really mm-hmm. change the narrative. Like the Jainshi do what they are always going to do, and the Steel Angels do what they are always going to do, and it's just these two forces clashing. The Kroll really doesn't do anything. He has no real role in the story <laughs> other than as a viewpoint. That actually reminds me of uh, some stories of Isaac Asimov, where essentially he had a view about history. It just happens, and there's, there's certain periods or things that happen. One phase goes to another, and then these certain characters try to do stuff, and it turns out it didn't matter. Like, it would happen mm. anyway. It was just, this is what's going to happen. This mm-hmm. society is going to run into this society, and either one's going to wipe the other one, or one's going to maybe subsume the other one and take elements into it. Like, it's just, these individuals didn't matter so much. I was interested yeah. in the godless um, Jane Chi that, that Nick Roll ends up hanging mm-hmm. out with, and the ways that, like, once the icon for them is lost, like, it completely changes their behavior. Like, I, yeah. I was interested yeah. in that concept, and I thought there was some interesting stuff there, but it didn't feel like it was fully kind of explored, like, what that, that means and how you're going to behave. But they do end up, some of them do end up, even after Nick Kroll, I think he dies, right, at the end, and they end up going to, um, is it Jameson's world? 
after that yeah 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 uh, yeah, yeah that's like the closest civilization mm-hmm. so they have some they have some kind of like autonomy and purpose beyond the crazy shit that everyone else is doing on this planet once they lose the faith which is interesting well once the janshi lose it a lot of them go it's bad on most of them right either they go, they go feral essentially like for most of them some yeah of them, that's what yeah. they were saying i mean it wasn't clear i, mean, I think they I can't remember who said that they go feral. Was that um, was that the trader or was that the? I think it was the trader. Said it, it, okay, said all right, yeah. They appear more and more. Feral. I guess, I mean, I guess it's always one of those things where it's hard to, you know, like a view a non-native oh, viewpoint. You trust, of, you trust the viewpoint, yeah. or maybe he doesn't have the knowledge. Right. But the point yeah. is, like, that they they had population in balance, and, and like it seemed like they were going to have too much population now. Like they, they, they yeah, I mean, it seemed like. Well. Right. Yeah, it seems like I mean, I guess I don't I don't really know for sure what was going on. I mean, maybe I uh maybe I missed some obvious things, but I mean, it kind of seems like the the gods or whatever is in those pyramids is essentially I mean, like it seems almost like a not a hive mind, but like a, you know, like some sort of, you know, psi entity that that basically controls them, right? I mean, like yes. the way they you know, yeah. don't eat, don't eat anything until like the population starts getting out of hand, and and the way that um, you know the uh, the escaped uh, or not escaped, I guess, but uh, the the refugee people from from destroyed pyramids either become feral or like the ones taken in by the trader, you know, have no actual memory of uh, no understanding of of mm. what they were doing or why, you know. And um, that's how the um the at the end <clears throat> the pyramid is able to conjure the image of back because it maybe reaches into their mind and pulls that exactly. out right yeah. right yeah and then it you know essentially is having them kill themselves you know well it seems the weird thing sci. Right. no matter what it is it seems sigh i don't know if, if it yeah that what my question is is, is it is it a collective jane she is it something else that's being put there is something to do with the harangans whatever it is it's, it's sigh based it seems yeah what, whatever it is it's sigh and i mean it seems I, I mean I don't know it seems like arguably as bad as the uh, as bad as the 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 knights or whatever right I mean like I mean it's essentially you know I mean it's not harming the the natives or whatever but I mean it is essentially running them right I mean it's it's treating them like you know cattle or something right like it's it's running their lives yeah I, I don't I didn't really understand the ending. I mean, I understand what yeah. happened, but I, I couldn't <laughs> understand what caused the that pale child to appear, which is what makes it all the more sort of scary and, and weirds you out. Um, like you could you could say it was literally magic or spiritual or something unexplainable happened in which the pale child appeared at the sort of center of the um, Steel Angels coalition. Like that was the god that they worshipped, therefore it sort of manifested in this place, in this pyramid, because that was the religion that was most concentrated at that point in the planet. But that's not a satisfactory scientific explanation. <laughs> so it could be, it could be the psi, it could be the the um, psychic energy or powers of the Jainshi or the bitter speaker. Um, I think what's interesting is though, like it's that was part of the cause in which kind of makes the steel angels go crazy when they start killing their own children and burning their crops. Like that's part of it. But I also think the other part of it is the steel angels are so militaristic. They're so destructive, so ruthless, so violent that when they have no one else to kill or subjugate, they have inevitably turn against themselves. Hmm. Like that, that kind of militarism combined with dogmatism it, it inevitably like corrupts the person that that is um projecting it. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of eats away. Enemies the... or heretics, you will just keep looking within your own circle. Like you, 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 you yeah, you, you're a sword that needs something to fight. You have something. You, yeah. you give somebody a sword and you put it in a hand. They're going to want to use it. Yeah, the devo- the violence directed at others inevitably is spiritually directed at, at yourself. That kind of thing. Um, I mean, from a literary perspective, I, I suppose that that's probably true, but. From like a uh, like what actually happened in the plot yeah. perspective, <laughs> I mean, I think that they're getting murdered by a native psy creature, right? I mean, it's, yeah, but, I but, they're, but they're doing it themselves, aren't they? They're killing their. Yeah, well, they're no, they're not. They're I mean, like controlled. Psy, yeah, they're being yeah. controlled. Like they're they're something has taken over their minds and is causing them to slowly kill themselves, right? I mean, like whether <laughs> I mean, I think there's a question about you know whether it actually whether I mean like I mean I think was suggesting and it's I think it's a reasonable mm. uh, uh, thought that the uh, the Bacalon statue perhaps didn't even physically transform right that it's just a, a so, that it's just uh, you know reaching into their minds to create the image of the oh, statue interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, think I, that's I, I was wondering was about that right? uh, I guess yeah. I I guess I've read it uh, maybe I misread it because what I thought was their psychic energy had produced the image. But the steel angels had just seen that image and did what was natural to them. 
Um, but you're saying they're literally being controlled or, or yeah, there are sorts of being manipulated. Right. You know, in the same way that I think that the natives are essentially being manipulated. Right. I mean, like they're not they're not living independently. I mean, we see that when when their pyramids are destroyed. Right. They they either go feral or, you know, the ones that are taken in by the trader essentially learn, you know, uh, I guess human for lack of a better, you know, whatever. Uh, lack of a better term, learn human behaviors, right? Because now they have, because uh, they have brains, right? They can use them if they're not being, uh, you know, controlled by a psi creature that's essentially limiting their ability to to think and make independent decisions. Mm-hmm. But when they are, but when they're living near their pyramids, like they're not making independent decisions, right? They're not living independently. They're they're living as part of a, I mean, essentially as the the appendages of you know some sort of psi thing so anyway so I, Michael, I find the pyramid somewhat malevolent <laughs> yeah no, i agree but i'm just curious then why do you think that the ways they influence the two um two species are different so with the jane she they make them more pacifistic and with the steel angels they kind of accelerate and just increase the the violence so why is that like why why is the approach different I mean, who knows for sure? I mean, I, I, I don't. I mean, obviously, we we have nothing from from their perspective, and so it's it's hard to say. That's fair um, enough. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's quite it's quite possible that that you know, um, you know, like if you think of them as as some sort of you know as a god or as you know something. I I, I always like in in science fiction, um, you know, where, where you have a creature that can influence the minds of other like i think pretty rarely do you actually get the perspective of the thing that can influence minds mm-hmm. but when you do uh they are often like especially if it's natural to them um they often you know don't think that there's anything immoral about what they're doing right like they can reach into somebody's mind the same way that like we can open our hand right and so they don't think they're doing anything wrong and so to them like you know it might be as simple as like oh i like these little you know these these fuzzy monkey creatures like they're, they're <laughs> they're nice right yeah. like you don't hurt people and they're cute and i like them and so why don't i you know create this little society for them where they get to you know have sex in the trees all the time and then these uh these outsiders come in and kill some of the psi creatures maybe right i mean they destroy these pyramids um so these outsiders come in destroy the these pyramids potentially killing some of the psi creatures at the very least um are disrupting uh, these little colonies of fun of fun little furry people, and so you know they're they're mad about them. They're like, well, okay, I guess we'll kill these. Guys. Like these guys are jerks. Like let's get rid of them. Like I don't like them here. You know? mm. Yeah, I guess what I'm wondering is like maybe the extent of the power of the the mind pyramids is to like amplify the already existing attitudes mm. of whatever creature they're they're affecting but maybe like there's no reason to believe that jane she are naturally pacifistic so maybe that there's no credibility to that but at least on the side of the steel well, they angels seem, they seem not to be naturally pacifistic, right exactly right? So, so they turn so, feral yeah. and and learn you know human behaviors right so there's no there's no reason to believe like that's the state that that's the state they would be drawing from so yeah it's interesting i'm not sure the uh, mm-hmm. the idea initially, uh, this discussion earlier because the proctor is getting visions and the guy says, "Oh, maybe the, I mean the Harangans had the soul sucks or whatever to give you false visions." Like the idea yeah. of false visions is placed there. It just seems to me that what's odd about it is, like you think that would also be bad for the Genshi, but they seem to be helped by this. Uh, so it's it's not really. I mean, you could say okay, they're being controlled, but if you compare what they were without it, on average, right? They weren't in a very good state. Like they seem more animal. Like they seem just chimps, essentially. Like the way they're acting, like being violent and well, but and, and, yeah, and, but only because only because they weren't, you know, given the freedom to form their own societies, right? Like who knows mm. what kind of society they could have formed if they had been left to do so, right? Because I mean, obviously they are intelligent, you know. I mean, like when um, when they are, you know, exposed to. You know, culture from from you know Jameson's colony via the trader whose name I can't remember. Um, you know, they they seem to adapt to it uh, pretty well, right? Um, you know, that's interesting. Well, I guess you could view it then that it is something Harangan based, where it was just the goal is to to keep pacify and control, and the Jainshi mm, were controlled sure, and yeah. the humans were not easily controlled, so they just decided to eliminate them instead. Yeah, that's possible. Sure, because those visions. Yeah, like, the guy's actually having visions. Like he's he burns his stuff because he has a vision. Like that doesn't make sense. Like right. when he burn his summer store, he's like, oh, because his winter store is because summer's coming. Yeah, like mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, and he was clearly like you know. I mean, to some degree, I mean, that's a fair point, right? Like to some degree, uh, it may be that that people, maybe everybody, but uh, but the um, 
but maybe especially, you know, fanatical people uh, have some degree of resistance. Right. And so like they slowly, you know, over time, um, over that first winter, like they worked on his mind and he prayed and they worked on his mind mm. and they worked on his mind. And then they showed him the signs that they promised him um, and then showed him the big sign that he took into his, you know, p- because like uh, proximity might play a play a role in it, too. Right. Like. So they could they could influence him uh, le- somewhat. Well, so proximity does make a role in Psy, right? Doesn't it? Like, I think with yeah, exactly. Gravity right. and proximity. Yeah. yeah, often. And so then they get them to you know like a Trojan horse, right? Like they get him to take the the Bacalin statue um, mm. into into the into the the walled compound, and then at that point it's you know close enough to everybody to be powerful enough pyramids to... are basically satellites i think or re- transmitters sure yeah you could think of it that way or the, yeah that's the a good point of... right they could just be yeah it could be a single being yeah. right that's just that uses the pyramids uh as uh yeah amplifiers or whatever yeah interesting um yeah i think that makes sense especially because they bring up the soul sucks i was kind of wondering what if the jane chi were the soul sucks <laughs> what if they were the original <laughs> enemies of humanity but now the tarangans are gone they just form their own societies but oh, I don't interesting. Know. there's probably well, plenty of species who have those those abilities well, what's interesting about it i mean they, 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 he wanted to give the the weapon to the jane she like elder and then he went and consulted like with the pyramid or prayed to the gods and said that's not the way to do it or something or like it seemed like there was whatever's there or had another plan or another route right yeah it, exactly it, fighting with weapons was not gonna work he's gonna get wiped out which does bear out, right? Because they are effectively pacified or dealt with because <laughs> they start killing themselves. Well, the J- Janshi are ultimately right. They, they say, no, we'll just wait. Our gods will help us. And they yeah. essentially... <laughs> and they did. They yeah. did. <laughs> they right. did the yeah, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> right. it, it reminds me a bit, actually, of the, the Nathi. The fact that like uh, people yeah. would try and take over the island and then one day they would just get really sick from the butterflies and die off so it's like in a way that they're pacifists because they've just been taught but from experience that if anyone tries to take over eventually they'll be able to just take over the minds of the the colonizers or they'll go crazy and kill each Mm -hmm. other or they'll just yeah die out so there's a there's a there's a way of fighting their enemies that their enemies don't understand the enemy is understanding technology and force and violence but they don't understand, yeah, like mind control and things like that. And that line you talked about, Duncan, earlier about like the first men adapting and joining a faith. I mean, that's kind of the last sentence is that essentially, right? It's in thousands, thousands of woods, the Jinshi are praying, and then in that city they're praying. They're all kind of converted to this local faith or this forms of this local faith. Yeah, I think that's what I, I really liked about this story. Like the fact that the Jane Chi originally just seemed like cute, cuddly teddy bears that you're um, <laughs> sympathetic towards because these yeah. big, scary men are coming to, to hunt them. And then by the end of it, like you're really e- freaked out by what they're capable of. Well, I mean, they're, they're Wookiees. That's, a, that's something yeah. I was going to bring up because I, I read an article. <laughs> uh, this story I actually had, uh, I think I read it years ago and I forgot about it. But I remember the, the title because there's articles back to 2010 at least. Where essentially people, uh, I think they make a fairly good argument saying that the artwork anyway for the story inspired Wookiees because it came a year before Star Wars, I think. And Mm -hmm. if you look at the artwork for Chewbacca and the cover for this book, it's like very similar. Uh, it so, is, yeah, especially with the ammunition. Um, which is funny because they're not but, med- they don't. Most of them don't carry weapons, right? It's, it's just the, yeah. the, the the physical characteristic was used for the Wookiees like with inspiration because that's what what they would do. Like if they're making some random sci fi movie, they might look at a bunch of art everywhere and say, "Oh, that looks cool. Use that." Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's I think it's very possible because it was seventy five. I think the story came out. And then um, I think some of the people who wrote the article pointed out that the original designs of Chewbacca mm-hmm. were very different. And then they changed. They were like hairless. It was this hairless creature, like more like an alien looking thing. And then it became more like a big teddy bear uh, <laughs> for, a, for a redraft. So 75 was this story with the cover and then 77 was Star Wars released. And I think it's very possible that a – that an artist, uh, you know, creating costumes for a science fiction movie would have seen a copy of Analog or would read, read Analog. Yeah, those guys are nerds. But, of course, yeah, they're yeah. reading this. Uh, like the amount of science fiction, you know, short story collections would have been only a dozen or so back then. So it's very possible. Who are the guys that are on the um, Return of the Jedi, those little ones? Like the little guys? Ewoks. Yeah. Ewoks. It's, it's Ewoks. Me the, when I read Genshi, I saw more Ewoks than, than Wookiees, though, in terms of size. I don't remember if the size yeah. is described. Wookiees is what the artist that drew it for Martin's work drew a large 
the character and then that was used but they, they seem small I, to me like children in the forest and i think the ewoks were originally meant to be um wookies mm-hmm. it was meant to be a planet Correct. of wookies but yes. they changed it to save money i guess on costumes <laughs> Or to get more yes, there was, there's supposed to be a whole part in the first Star Wars movie where, like, they went and did all this stuff, but that was all cut. Mm. Yeah. And we eventually get some of that Return of the Jedi. Don't but I, I think... Wookiees it... Wookie in the Star Wars Sorry. Christmas movie or something? Or there's a Chris... <laughs> there is, yes. <laughs> life Day. <laughs> Happy Life Day. Um, but I think it's interesting, like, yeah, the, the Ewoks, in fact, are a bit similar, a bit, bit closer to what you imagine the Jainshi would be and it's a very similar setup like this yeah. technologically advanced stormtroopers um invading Steel this knights. uh <laughs> this very technological primitive army of teddy bears uh the teddy bears the, the, the ewoks are far less um pacifist than the jane she it seems but they overpower them by their knowledge of the land um through more primitive tactics um and again i think uh lucas has even stated that the, the battle of endor was meant to be a an allegory for the Vietnam War. It was a, mm. a primitive uh, army versus a technological advanced army, and the technologically advanced army was creamed. Well, not creamed. I shouldn't say that, but it was it was eventually worn down and, and had to withdraw. Mm. Logs beat ATSTs <laughs> every time. Um. Yeah, well, why, well, why use lasers? Just use logs. They're yeah. more effective. I wanted to ask. So, of course, I know it's drawn from that song that you mentioned, Duncan, but what do you guys think the title of this story means relative to the story? Because hmm. I have no idea. Like, I have no idea what it, what it's supposed to indicate. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a cool it's a cool line. Um, I think, what was the whole passage? So it's, you may kill yourselves and your mates and your cubs as you need, and you can, but kill not for pleasure and seven times never kill man. And it's from Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book. I mean, I don't know. I guess, the, I mean, the one thing that I hmm. took, right, is that it's saying don't kill man, right? Like man is a special category. And that's the whole thing with the, uh, uh, you know, the Bakloon people. I, I don't know why I can't think of what they're called. Steel angels I want to call them the knights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Steel, steel angels. There you go. Thank you. Um, that's their whole thing, right? Like everything is an animal or a man. And mm-hmm. in the, ju- the Jungle Book seems to be, the Kipling thing seems to be making the same point, right? Like animals are different than man right like don't kill man and hmm. uh and the steel angels are wrong right like what is a man is sort of i mean it's not like i mean i think the answer is pretty clear right it's not like a philosophical discussion in the story you know like obviously the the steel angels are wrong and uh you know and the uh the natives could easily could should be considered you know men in the sense of you know sapient creatures hmm. uh, so i that's what, what i assumed gotcha. was that it was just about like what is a what is a man versus what is an animal? Gotcha. Well, yeah, I, the interesting thing with I, the steel angels. I mean, they don't like Necrawl, but they don't like they don't want to kill him unless like he gets in their way because he's still considered to have a soul or whatever. And then they also react heavily when one of theirs is killed by the Janshi, right? That's what really pushes them to killing all these uh, Janshi. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point. The the idea of what constitutes a man or a human is a very different context between the jungle book and, and this sort of science fiction universe. Um, I think the idea of killing for pleasure, the sort of ruthlessness and the brutality and the sadism of the steel angels evokes, um, this, this, uh, killing for pleasure, um, or this they... killing to, to dominate and subjugate yeah. rather than because they need to, to survive. Um, but I was, uh, I did watch, I did do a little bit of research about the story and I confess I watched the, uh, Preston Jacobs review of this, uh, oh, no. of this story. No. Which was actually quite good. It wasn't particularly conspiratorial. It was more just a, a straight um, a review or analysis of the story. And he brought up a really good point about the quote from Rudyard Kipling, which was that the Jungle Book, and in fact, a lot of Kipling's work, has strong themes of British colonialism. Mm. Um, there's allegories right into the Jungle Book. And in general, you know, Kipling's um, uh, White Man's Burden poem is often seen as a justification yeah. for intervention in other countries for humanitarian purposes. Um, and I think in this context, it's quite interesting because obviously Kipling's work was set against the backdrop of British uh, empire, whereas Martin is writing in the era of American empire and against the backdrop of Vietnam and incursions in all these countries to stem the tide of communism and things like that. So I think um, I definitely read the Steel Angels as more in that line of like American imperialism, American militarism, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I think I think that's maybe where um, part of the inspiration from the quote comes from. That this is American uh, violence and intervention that Martin is kind of framing his text around in his uh, parable. 
I buy it. That's interesting because the steel. I mean, if you if you, if you go, follow that analogy, I mean, the American American military anyway was needed in the world wars, right? Especially World War Two, it was needed, and then maybe mm-hmm. you could say that maybe it went too far at times, right? It was going over broad and going to Vietnam and so forth. But the, 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 the America withdrawing of the world was not needed. Like it didn't help at that time, right? Like it was needed in World War Two. Oh, absolutely, American industry, whatnot. But then you see how far that can go when you get to like nuclear technology and it becomes a bit more ambiguous what uh, what is right and wrong. There's this great line at the start, this idea that um, it's one, I think it's one of the Jane Shee characters basically saying like that he did not believe in evil because like evil is like a, a concept of faith that he didn't have or, it's, or no, it's the traitor character, like the other traitor character or something. Um, and he essentially says he learns what evil is because of these steel angels. Like that, that idea that like evil is like a nest, like to, for evil to be necessary, you have to have, have belief in something. So mm-hmm. I don't know, that's just interesting yeah. to think about relatives to all this. Yeah. Yeah. Evil is like almost a higher calling in a way than just, you know, uh, selfishness or exploitation evil requires like a project of of suffering and cruelty like a long-term project and w- and relative to all this this stuff with world war ii and the ways that escalated is like is there is like it was a very clear like we need to defeat the evil you know mm. we need to defeat the evil in the world but but then when you keep seeking evil <laughs> it uh it can uh it can go go too far. Yeah, and that's interesting, I think, because if you look at the origin stories of the Steel Angels, there was a very clear evil that needed to be defeated. The Harangans and the Findies were attacking them. So they got to operate their violence from a from a position of feeling victimized and feeling righteous. And now, I guess, if we follow on with the Vietnam War allegory, now America is in a position of power. The Steel Angels are in a position of power. Now they're fighting uh, they're the invaders. They're the people victimizing the weaker, they or the weaker become people. Evil, the destroyer of worlds. Yeah, yeah something like that. <laughs> it's a little tenuous. <laughs> so, so I like I I, I liked all that kind of big imagery and big kind of yeah. I don't know. All those big ideas were quite compelling. I thought. One last point on my end, and one question. Just a point. We, I mean, we talked about earlier, but the, the elder specifically says not only the, like, but we deal with them. It says if they come, our God shall speak to them. Like she'll speak to them, right? So he and he's correct. Not not only deal with them, but like interact with them. Uh, but one question in terms of the uh, the the statues, they start. I mean, the, the Jainji themselves starts carving the the, the Bacalon statues, and it seemed to be implied maybe the trader gave them info to one of them. But then there was many of them being made. Like, does that also maybe somehow they're being communicated by a sigh or by distance? Because it's it seemed to be there was more than one place making those statues. Like the Jainji, were- yeah. Right. I yeah, I agree. There's something um something is is yeah, like reading him and figuring out what it is that he thinks art should be like mm. and then giving it to him, right? And that's why it looks fake to to real art collectors, right? Because it's not it's not from something alien, right? It's actually yes. It's just it's it's a it's a you know through a mirror darkly or whatever uh, from his brain of like what what a uh, native art should should be like or what primitive art should be like. Um, as far as the Thousand World stuff, quick, there's a mention of Tomas Chang, a legendary Avalonian linguist, whatever that is, <laughs> which I guess is some kind of <clears throat> understander of languages. Um, but is that a name that appears anywhere else, or is that just a? Not, not Thomas Chung, but Thomas Chung worked for uh, Chloronymus, who is a really important character. And he's mentioned in a few yeah. of the stories. He was mm. mentioned in uh, Peter Bloom's last episode. And oh, okay. he um, he did the – during the in- interregnum, he was sent out by Avalon to conduct a survey along with a bunch of other ships, a survey of the galaxy. Three ships never came back. Two of them came back after a limited survey, whereas Chloronymus like basically voyaged, voyaged for years and tried to reconnect with all these other um, sort of isolated human worlds. And one of the, the worlds he came across was um, Corlys, and his uh, linguists interacted with the Jane G and they developed a, a way to understand them. So that was one of the encounters that Chloronymus has. And uh, next episode, we'll learn a lot more about Chloronymus. Actually, one final point Exciting. I forgot to bring up because we – Kind of all jumped over Nekral's death. We didn't, I guess, we didn't care much about him. He was, he was, <laughs> really, he, no. He was trying to help. Like he was, he, he was, a, he was actually. I mean, he was a, he was a hero. Like he was trying to help people, and he was doing. He was not a fighter. He could barely move. He was, he was trying to help these people, and then he dies, mm-hmm. and then, uh, and then they, they, they make a like a doll of him or whatever, a, a statue, like they, they carve something. a shroud. And because uh, it has a, and it's almost like um, the tribute of a widow or a child. And it's like 
it, it just to me it's, it seemed like okay now is there going to be like these Jainshi that are leaving the world is 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 Necrol going to become like a messiah or a character for them like the pale child mm-hmm. was like is this the birth of a new religion <laughs> or something if, if you go with that because they're leaving the, the world now like the pregnant Jainshi yeah so that's kind of cool so everybody else, everything else carved was kind of like godlike, like they were gods or they read. So it just it was kind of interesting. Okay, so what do we have coming up next, Duncan, for the next uh, episode? Uh, yes. So uh, the next episode, we'll be reviewing the Glass Flower and the Stone City. And uh, unlike most Thousand World stories, these texts are set far away from human civilization and deal with distant alien cultures. And they're also two stories which I think benefit most from having a bit of background knowledge about. A thousand world settings i think it's good to have a few stories under your belt before you read them um so yeah we'll be doing that next time cool love those titles good yeah. <laughs> yeah. 